Hello, and welcome to an intro to Anthro with Two Humans. I'm human number one, John McRae. And I'm human number two, John Lear. And this is the podcast where we reassess what it means to be human. And the title of today's episode is Dragons, Demons, and Monkeys, A Personal and Anthropological History of Addiction. Yes. <laughs> All right. Now, I feel like I should be teaching this one. I know. Hey, do you want to take over? Do you want No, to... <laughs> no. Let's just co-teach it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I guess, you know, I, it's no secret. We've made no secret of the fact that we're both recovering alcoholics and recovering drug addicts. Yes. I mean, that, that, yes. that's no, that's yes. no knowledge, I think. No, uh-uh. that's a fact that's been quoted. <laughs> and, I mean, that, that's the only thing that has been quoted out of our podcast and other. <laughs> in many contexts, in, in many, many contexts, context. there's court <laughs> records. <laughs> and, you know, you and I have actually, we, we've written a live show called Addiction mm-hmm. 101, which yes. you perform around the country. Yes, I've got one it. coming up. Got really? one coming up at uh, uh, the uh, Betty Ford Clinic. I, I didn't even tell you Really? This. No. Yes. No. <laughs> That's very nice. The That's Betty very Ford nice. Betty Ford is celebrating their 41st anniversary or something like that. Wow. And uh, I'm, their, I'm their headliner. Oh, nice. Sorry. Nice. I'm their headliner. Um. And then also, in, you know, in our, that's exciting, by the way. Yeah. Congratulations yeah, to the Betty Ford Clinic. That's actually a good thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and in our series of comedic lectures that we did uh, many years ago, we, we also talked about our addiction. In yes, there, we Ford's. sure did. <laughs> our show that started in LA was a smash hit to our surprise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And ended up uh, going to uh, off Broadway. Off Broadway, yeah. New York City. Um, and, and you know, what was fun about that show or what was interesting and kind of uncomfortable at times too, is you and I were both in therapy at the time. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we yeah. were both confronting our demons. At yes, the time. we were. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, I always remember we were trying to be, we were very, trying to be very authentic. That, that a big part of that theme of that show was being authentic and just yeah. being who, not yeah. trying to pretend to be somebody we weren't. I right. Is- Either way, by by making it hyperbolizing it or diminishing it, we wanted right. to kind of try to get in that pocket <laughs> there. I thought we did yeah. a pretty good job. I think so. I I try not to pretend I'm anything other than I am. I think yeah, even you're, now, yeah, you're you're very uh very 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 humble man. <laughs> <It's>, uh, <laughs> but I remember, you know, when you do, I, I've directed a couple of theater shows now and been mm-hmm. involved with a lot of theater shows. But there's always a time that comes when, when you're in the rehearsal pro- process, and at some point the, the cast just gets pissed off at the director. Yes, <laughs> they, just, they just rebel. They, they're yes. tired of being told what to do. It's the part of the it's part of the process. They take right. the show on. They 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 take the show away from the director, and and it's right. supposed to happen. It's like when your teenagers hate you. They're supposed to. They're supposed to not not hate you, but not want to spend yeah. time with you. You know that's what you <laughs> that's that's what you're hoping for. Yeah, yeah. They want to go yeah. go out in the world on their own. You know, but but like with teenagers, it can get very with a cast. It can get very emotional mm-hmm. and get very confrontational. I think. Uh huh. Oh, wait a minute. Where are you going with this? Are you going to bring up? <laughs> no. Yeah, we have some business we have to take care of. Oh, if everybody no. could just, if everybody could just leave the room. If you're listening to this, please, <laughs> please fast forward and leave the room. We have to work some stuff out. <laughs> no, but but I remember when that time, and we, it was just you and me. I mean, it was a cast yeah. of one. Yes. And uh, the best. And show, I mean, and I a love. production team of one. Yeah, it was you and me in your living room. <laughs> but I remember when uh, when that happened, and we had that moment where you were like, you rebelled, and you were like, "Okay, I'm taking over the show," you know, because you were just like tired, tired. We were working so hard on it. And I remember our producer was there. Lauren was there. Oh, Lauren! And, yeah, Lauren. I forgot about Lauren. And uh, she said afterwards that that was the calmest. Uh, <laughs> most, uh, I don't know, patient rebellion she had ever seen in a cast 
cast cast argument with the director because you and I were both in therapy, so it was all like, <laughs> I, I hear what you're saying. <laughs> If I'm understanding what you're saying correctly. Yeah. When you do that, it makes me feel this <laughs> Well, that shit works. People make fun of it. I make fun of it, but it, it works. Know. It works. Uh, but but I would say thank you, therapy. <laughs> thank you, therapy. But yes, for, thank you, for, therapy. Uh, if you haven't tried it, please. I don't know. It, it, I think it's a wonderful thing. It's, it yes. really works on you if you want yes. to figure out. Yes, please. <laughs> uh, so again, I would say alcoholism, uh, addiction, and recovery has been a big part of our personal relationship, mm-hmm. definitely. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I thought today we could talk about alcoholism and addiction, mm-hmm. uh, not only between us, but also in the big scheme of thing for like yeah. for humans, how it has affected humans. Excellent, love it. Uh, and, and first off, I want to say that, you know, the title of this episode, Dragons, Monkeys, and, and Demons, mm-hmm. is an acknowledgement of how we as humans, I think, have often dealt with our addictions. Mm-hmm. And, and, and to me, it, it's like, if you think of like how people refer to addiction, dragons, monkey, you got a monkey on your back, you're slaying the dragon, uh, demon rum. I mean, mm-hmm. these are the same uh, metaphors are the same mm-hmm. images that we use for mythological beasts mm-hmm. that, that, that we use to, to fight. Yes. And, uh, and uh, I think it's probably it, it's, or even supernatural beasts. So it's, again, it's, we're fighting something that we can't see. I, I just found it interesting as I was putting this one together, that these are, are things that we, we use those same symbols mm-hmm. elsewhere. Mm hmm. And, you know, when you talk about in literature, when you talk about fighting a demon or fighting a dragon, uh, they're, they're existential battles. You know, it's, it's like you... It's for, all the, it's for all the marbles. Right, right. You don't go out and like, yeah, I'm going to just go out and, you know, talk to... The, the exorcist doesn't go out and say, okay, I'm going to just go talk to the devil. <laughs> and be like, okay, man, we're cool here. You know, we're all good. As long as we all understand each other, we're cool. Here, you know, yeah. it's like only one person's coming back from that fight, I guess is what I would say. <laughs> uh, so first of all, John, I just want, I think we should deal with is why, why do some people become addicts and other people don't? Yeah. What the hell? I mean, I, I've always seen it just, you know, based on my experience, anecdotal, yeah, and, and what I've read about it and whatnot, is, yeah. it, you know, it's like all those complicated things we always end up saying, well, a lot of it's genetic and and some of it's not, you know, and, yeah. Uh, yeah. and or, or that certain genetic uh, uh, attributes get triggered by certain environmental uh, situations. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, but I guess that goes for just about everything, you know, that's kind of the, the answer to all of our behavior nowadays. It it seems like we say, well, it's a combo and depending on certain circumstances, it triggers what's already wired into you. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, uh, I don't know. It's much more complicated than what I think people throughout history have always said, which is like, oh, it's a question of willpower or something. Right. Right. You and know. we've always, and, and in, in the show, we joked around that the only people uh, <laughs> who have willpower are people who don't need it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, uh, yeah, I think there's definitely, there has to be a genetic predisposition to addiction, probably. Yeah. Uh, well, I know certain, my dad. Yeah. 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 I was just about d- to go to the same place, our family. Yeah, and and my dad used to always say like he he would say like I wish I could just have a beer with a sandwich, but mm-hmm. he knew that like he couldn't have a beer with a sandwich <laughs> because once you had a beer even with a sandwich it was like it was off to the races at that. Yeah, point. I always and, say to people like uh, yeah I you know I I'd be I'm fun for the first ninety minutes. <laughs> You know? Yeah, <laughs> but then it's yeah. like, uh, where did John go, and where are the car keys? Yeah, usually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'm the same way. It's like I wish I could have, like, I love like all kinds of different liqueurs or wines or something from all over the world, and I wish mm-hmm. I could just 
have a glass of wine or so, but mm-hmm. I can, I, I know that it's, uh, once I have a glass of wine or a, a beer, I'm going to wake up a few days later out in the desert with my pants off or something. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, I'm here to tell you, you can't have a glass of wine. I've been with you. <laughs> I, I know. <laughs> uh, so psychology today, uh, or uh, it's uh, in an article called why do we get addicted to things? Uh, an author by the name of Knuvel shake uh, quotes a woman, Maureen Boyle at the national Institute on drug abuse. And Boyle says the same thing that w- what you just said. She says addiction is a biopsychosocial disorder. Hmm. It's a combination of your genetics, your neurobiology and how that interacts with the psychological and social factors. Hmm. Hmm. So again, uh, and then psychology today says, uh, it comes down to a very complex array of cultural factors, social factors, and situational factors that mingle with psychological factors, biological factors, and even personal values to influence the possibility of addiction. And that's so, really a scientist's way of saying, we don't know what the fuck. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a lot of things. There's a, lo- it's a lot, there's a lot going on. on. Yeah. And, and I think it's it's probably hard because you can't really predict anything off that because it's right. just everybody's different. So and I know even like brothers and, and, you know, siblings with the same background, the same nature, nurture, twins. It, yeah, yeah. You know, it's crazy. Yeah. And uh, and I think it's hard to not only predict it, but also hard to treat it because then you have to go in and kind of treat all of those different that combination mm-hmm. of traits or that mm-hmm. combination of personality. Mm-hmm. I don't know. And then, and then you talk about like, well, what are the environmental factors that set it off? Yes. As well. Yes, you know? absolutely. And, uh, and also there, you know, when we talk about, you know, is there a, an addictive personality? And I've always thought myself that I had an addictive personality. Like there was something, something yeah. about me. Like if I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna do it all the way. You know, yeah, I mean, whatever. That is, is who you are. You that is who you are. <laughs> but uh psychology uh today again says uh there's no such thing. It's a myth of the addictive personality. Huh. And maybe and I mean that's psychology today, I don't know. Uh but they say there are a number of personality traits widely shared in the population that contribute to the risk of developing an addiction, mm-hmm. usually in indirect ways. And so in other words, there may not be a single personality trait for addiction. Uh, a person may have a combination of other personality traits, such as anxiety, depression, low self-esteem, thrill-seeking, low frustration threshold that may uh, predispose them to addiction. Yes. Yes. I certainly relate to some, depression's a part of my story, as is thrill-seeking. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's a bad combo. Yeah, I had a few of them in there. I could check off a few of them in <laughs> yeah. there. Uh, yeah. So I think it's, again, it's it's hard to say, but it's it's like if you already have that built in, mm-hmm. and then you, again, if how you confront an environmental stress or, or whatever it is, mm-hmm. uh, people will respond in different ways to it. So, mm-hmm. um. And then, but one thing that all of the researchers seem to agree upon is that when you, when you take drugs or alcohol, it affects the brain's reward circuit. Hmm. So within your brain, uh, the National Institute on Drug Abuse says that when someone takes drugs, it causes euphoria by flooding the brain's reward circuit with dopamine. Mm, dopamine. <laughs> yeah, it sounds pretty yeah. good to me. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. 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 There's Give a part me some of me that. like, okay, all right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Give me uh, some of that. <laughs> but the dopamine, of course, is, is like a naturally occurring chemical. Right. And from an evolutionary or biological standpoint, dopamine is, was there and still there to make us keep doing things we need to do to survive as an individual and also as a species. So, so for example, sex. eating. Eating. <laughs> sex. Yes. Yeah. Sex. Eating. Unfortunately, yeah. we've we've gotten two smarter big brains have found other ways to trigger <laughs> dopamine. Right, right. 
it, it, it would you would you take drugs? I mean, we've created drugs now that will like give us that dopamine. Yes. Uh, when we're doing things that we don't need to be doing. <laughs> right. That's <laughs> you know. right. It's like sitting on the couch and watching Dune. And I'm talking right. about the original one. <laughs> Right. Or going to a club, <laughs> going out to a club and dancing all night and having crazy sex. And it's like, uh-huh. yeah, yeah. Or sitting in your underwear and watching cartoons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so what happens is the, the surges of dopamine uh, in the reward circuit uh, cause the reinforcement of pleasurable but unhealthy behaviors like taking drugs, leading people to repeat the behavior over and over again. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. makes sense makes sense yeah and then as we over time of course we we develop a tolerance to it you know yeah. the more you do it yeah, but and that's no problem you just do more just do yeah, <laughs> yeah, just, yeah just, that's so what, what? You know. problem, problem, problem solved, solved. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah uh but Again, the National Institute on Drug Abuse says, you know, it, it, the reward circuit is impaired through through this tolerance that we build up. Yeah. And brain adaptations in the reward circuit will, quote, often lead to the person becoming less and less able to derive pleasure from other things they once enjoyed, like food, sex, or social activities. Yes. Yep. <laughs> I was, yep. I was that way. I was the, after, you know, at a certain time, it's like, I didn't get, I didn't want to see anybody. I didn't want to talk to anybody. I just wanted no. to stay at home and get fucked up. You know? Well, you and I shared a certain nihilism uh, aspect of yeah. it. Uh, that was that we, um, we both enjoyed just kind of um, diving into, I think, yeah. in, in yeah. our own different ways. But yeah, yeah. Just see how far we could go and like just yeah. go, just <laughs> keep it going, keep the party going. But there was always a time with me when it would like, it would, that the dial would be turned and suddenly oh, it wasn't. Yeah. It wasn't <laughs> yeah. I was around for that. <laughs> yeah. Things got weird then. Things got really yes, weird. Yes, they did. You got this strange <laughs> grin on you. But the crazy part is that's when I got excited. That's when I was like, all yeah. right, now where are we going? <laughs> we fed each other. We <laughs> Here fed each he other. goes. <laughs> uh, and because this is an anthropology podcast, I just wanted to bring up another uh, theory about possible uh, like alcoholism in humans. And that's uh, in 2000, there was an article by uh, Robert Dudley who's an anthropologist called the evolutionary origins of human alcoholism in prime primate fugivory and fugivory yes. fruit eating. <laughs> well, I'm very so, familiar with this. This, we, we yeah, kind of took, yeah. you took this and we ran with it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We, it, it's a fascinating theory. Fascinating. Yeah, so, so and yeah, like John's saying, we talk about this in addiction one to one, but, but what Robert Dudley is saying is his hypothesis is that, there was a time when it was more beneficial for prehistoric primates to eat fermenting fruit. Yes. And the reason, the reason why is because fermenting fruit has more sugars. And easier has to get. More, it's laying it's on the ground get. instead of up high in the tree. It tastes exactly. good because it's sugary. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know? And it has more calories. And, uh-huh. uh he says that humans who regularly consume alcoholic beverages may derive two to ten percent of their total caloric intake from ethanol. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Those are my people. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and they're the ones who would go after the woolly mammoth. Right, because going after a woolly mammoth, you got to be fucked up to think that that's going to work out in your favor. Yeah, yeah, you just got a spear and a loincloth. <laughs> And it's got tusks the size of a VW Beetle, you know? And you're like, I, let's get it. Yeah. It's going to be yeah. a little wasted. <laughs> you know, life is really hard and has been hard for human beings for, you know, millennia. And and being yeah. a little buzzed just takes the edge off. That's why they <laughs> drank so much in the 1800s. It, it sucked. Yeah. It sucked. I mean, it, and, you know. Yeah. Now it's better. I, I, I mean, in those sense, in that way, it's better. I but don't know. we still need to get our dopamine hit. Now we've invented these little phones that do it for us. You know? Oh yeah, that's the worst one. I think the phone. It's the is, worst. It's worse yeah. than cocaine, which is really saying something. 
Because cocaine yeah. is just the worst there is. That's the stupidest. <laughs> when you wait, when you hear those birds chirping at four in the morning, oh god, yeah. it's just the worst. All your money's <laughs> gone. <laughs> but, but but the thing is, I mean, still like uh, socially and culturally, you couldn't be taking out like a mirror and <laughs> right and, toot, no. and tooting away no in your office, and yet right. we people are, or I guess some offices, they entertain their business maybe, <laughs> but uh, but people can get out their phones and get that same dopamine hit uh, totally. by looking at Facebook or whatever. I have fallen down some YouTube, uh, those shorts or Instagram reels, you know, where you just flip one after the other, after the other, after, before I go to bed and I can't fall asleep because it's got me worked up into some, I don't even know what the hell it's doing to my brain, but I'm definitely feeling the effects of something. Yeah. It reminds me of, of, you know, taking drugs. Yeah. And do you think it's, it's like a, uh, it's diminishing return on it or so it's like you got to constantly be checking that thing yeah yeah um yeah and but when i'm checking it for like business stuff or if i'm reading or even the news at first it doesn't affect me as much as when i'm like it's that instagrammy quick hit you know three to 15 second video you know right. that, that that just changes 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 that there's something it's doing something wacky to my head man yeah. Do you find that it, it uh, and we'll have to do a show on uh, lots of people have written about social media, but do you find that like in your personal life too, do you find that your attention span has changed or do you? I'm sorry. I, I wasn't paying attention. Ah. <laughs> oh, good night, everybody. <laughs> I set it up on a tee. Uh, you, you did it. <laughs> Wolf <of> ball. Uh, <laughs> probably. I don't know. You tell yeah. me. You uh, what do you think? How am I doing? I, no, I well, I I don't know. I find for myself, it's like I'm checking the news all the time. Yeah, me too. Like I, do I got to know what's going on in the world and why I need to know what's going on in the world. I don't know all, every single moment. Well, some uh, of that's to, having to do with what's going on in the world because <laughs> it yeah, is the yeah. craziest of all. You know, in the in, in recent history, and by recent history, I mean a few hundred years. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it's, yeah, it's important to know, but, but it just shows you how, I don't know, things have just sped up and we got to, it's like, (laughs) you got to, you got to keep hitting that phone all the time to keep up with what's going on in the world or whatever. And that's why you should settle down and listen to a nice podcast (laughs) with a couple of buddies, you know, take it easy. Yeah. Get some people Mm -hmm. over, gather around the (laughs) <laughs> mm-hmm. gather around your phone to listen to this thing yep gather and around it. your bluetooth speaker like they did in the old days for a little fireside yeah. chat sit back and enjoy mm-hmm. <laughs> you can even <laughs> binge them like listen to them all at once yes you can listen to one, a different one in each ear <laughs> burn right fantastic. through them that sounds fantastic <laughs> <laughs> We should put out that, like, if you play them backwards, there's like, it says some mus- some yes. message. Yes. Or, you know, start the yeah. addiction episode. With the, start the Wizard of Oz on the, <laughs> the, when the music <laughs> starts the Wizard of Oz on the end. If you watch Barbie, if you start Barbie from the very <laughs> top, <laughs> right? And then when, yeah, right play the was- addiction episode, then you'll, you'll the, the message it. They're commenting on the addiction episode, or they're mm-hmm. commenting on them. Right when I say human number two, that's when you hit start. <laughs> okay. Uh, so then, John, uh, just so when did alcohol and drug addiction become a problem for humans? That was the other thing. Yeah, doing. yeah. And, uh, you know, I think, uh, I think it helped. Right. Yeah. I mean, a lot, uh, you know, in terms of uh, medicinal purposes and uh, like it seemed like it was a, a, a pretty amazing uh, uh, invention. Uh, yeah. And then it just kind of turned on you like it does for the individual alcoholic. It works for a while. It makes you confident, <laughs> yeah. makes you feel a part of and you fit in and, you know, you can yeah. handle things that you couldn't handle. And then then slowly it just kind of turns on the worm the worm eats its own tail and suddenly it does the opposite. And then that's when the spiral begins. Right. Right. At least in my case. No, I think, uh, 
Yeah, and and I think historically probably people were doing it because the water was so bad. Right. <laughs> so right. Water would give you diarrhea, you know, so you yeah, wanted to drink have some like wine. beers. Or, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Or if you're on a ship, like I've been reading those books about guys on ships and how miserable it was. And man, if they oh. didn't have their grog or whatever it was, they would <laughs> mutiny. They're like, I must be buzzed all the time because it's yeah. miserable on this rat infested little wooden thing where we can die any second. Oh, you know? and the food I was w- bad. And then food they, was they'd bad. Always- the work was hard. Just those barrels. They talk about the barrels of water that they'd have on there. And you know that that stale water just sitting oh. there in that barrel for oh. three months or whatever. It was. Oh, God. <laughs> you, had to, you had to drink. You had to drink. Uh, so in his article, Alcohol, Anthropological, Archaeological Perspectives, Michael Dietler said that alcohol is currently the most widely used human psychoactive agent around the world, hmm. which kind of makes sense. So sugar doesn't qualify as a psychoactive agent? I guess not. I mean, when he's hmm. he's looking at actually, I mean, his article was about alcohol, mm-hmm. but uh, right, yeah, but yeah, sugar. I, I, I would I, think sugar is the only thing that's close. Yeah, but yeah. but weed just weed is coming up fast. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, that, yeah, it's like Seven Eleven out here in Albuquerque. It's oh. probably even more and. Yeah, I saw a guy uh, my just today. My daughter and I were driving to uh, Trader Joe's to do a little grocery shop. And there was like a middle aged gentleman in a jogging outfit smoking a joint before he goes for his run. <laughs> <laughs> and my daughter goes, "That's so Californian." I go, "Yeah, it is." I wish I wish you had followed it. I would have loved it, Patty, on this episode. <laughs> Just Talk a little, about little buzz for his run. Yeah. Uh, and Dealer says that historically, at the time of European colonization, which was like in the 1500s, there mm. were only a few parts of North America and the Pacific that had no alcoholic drinks. Hmm. So basically, wow. everybody had kind of figured out, again, like we always talk about, that sometimes a good idea or an idea is, is yes. throughout the world. It's, a, it's not just one place and then everybody. Yeah, figured, you this know, was a it, good one because it made a <laughs> miserable life more tolerable. And, uh, for example, in China, there's evidence of fermenting rice and honey and fruit going back to the 7th millennium. Wow. BCE. Jesus. Yeah. And in the Middle East, there's evidence of alcohol production going back to the 6th millennium. BCE, uh, and then they also see like uh, in the country of Georgia, uh, there's wine production about that same time in the sixth millennium, and uh, beer production, barley beer production in Iran a few centuries later. So it's it's alcohol's been around a long time, I guess. Um, yes, it has. Wow, it's, it, beer started in Iran in Persia, huh? Well, I mean that's one of the places that. That we, but like there's you said, archaeological it, evidence of it. Yeah, so. right. <laughs> and uh, I always wonder what, how somebody figured that out, you know? <laughs> or cheese. Cheese is a crazy one. Yeah, yeah. Who figured that out? Well, I'm not the first one. It. Wait yeah. a minute. <laughs> don't throw it out. Wait, don't throw don't it out. Throw I'm, it gonna out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna eat that. Wait no, a second. Really? I'm gonna put it in a stomach <laughs> of the animal. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, uh, but Dietler says that, it, and this I'm not sure about this, but this is this is Dietler talking. Uh, mm-hmm. He says it's even been Dealer. suggested that <laughs> that the desire for beer may have been responsible for the original domestication of cereals in the eighth millennium BCE. <laughs> I believe it. I believe it a hundred percent. You yeah. want to get uh, you want to get some uh, the things that people did when when weed was illegal to grow weed in their closets yeah. the yeah. oh my god the rigs that they invented and the uh, uh it was yeah. amazing it was amazing that I saw in college you know kids trying to grow it and oh you got to pick the flowers before this or it'll inseminate and oh my god yeah do you think people, do you think they're still growing their own? Like some people are like, nah, I like my own. <laughs> like, I don't, like, don't want to go to the well, store. I like yeah, my Yeah, I do. Cause it's cheaper. 
I mean, my dad yeah. made his own wine. It was terrible, apparently. <laughs> but he had his own wine. I think that was kind of a thing in the 70s. Lots of people had their yeah. own wine making kits or something. Yeah. And a lot of people make their own uh, beer. But yeah. Uh, yeah. Did you ever try that? Did you ever try, like, as a kid, like, oh, I'm going to put some orange juice in a bottle and put a balloon on the top? And Never did. My dad did. My <laughs> grandfather did it. My grandfather made huge jugs of that. Oh, really? There would, be oh. A, there would always, on their back patio, be a big thing of, a big jug of something with a balloon on it. <laughs> <laughs> how, about, how about hooch? How about, like, prison hooch? You ever, like, you know, that's where you... Throw some fruit mm-hmm. juice and some bread and put it in the back of a toilet. <laughs> you ever do that? <laughs> you ever Never try did that? that. No, uh-uh. Drink it right out of the bag. No, so. I'd drink it. Why not? <laughs> Why not? Yeah. You know, when I was in uh, uh, Africa, there was a guy, my brother and all, and I, I think I told you this story. We looked up in a palm tree and there was a guy up there with like a plastic <laughs> grocery bag just sitting there. And then we saw them, a couple of them and we were like, what, what are those guys doing up there? And then what they would do is they would go up and somehow rig it with a plastic bag to make their own wine. And then they just go up in the palm tree and drink it and just <laughs> lay down in the palm tree. Yeah. I never told you this. I think you, I think you mentioned it. Yeah, uh, it, It's true. Absolutely true. So it, was it like a, like a coconut, coconut? Liquor I don't know. It must why? have been like it must have been like a I don't know one of those uh, not not prunes, but uh, I don't I don't know I don't yeah. know. It, was, uh, <laughs> it had some fruit up there that they would then you jerry rig it with a yeah with a plastic yeah. shopping bag, and somehow that would turn into wine, and then they would just go up there with a straw and sit up there. <laughs> Get that, wasted. Sounds, that sounds fantastic. It really I'm does. Surprised, I'm surprised you didn't crawl up there with. Them. I was. Like, I wanted to, over. but they were like, "Yeah, everybody had their you. You had your tree. You know, nobody would go. Really? You, you know, everybody had their own tree." Wow! Wow! <laughs> uh, apparently, even by like the third millenn- millennium BCE. Uh, there was a class distinction between those who drank wine, <laughs> the mm. upper class, and those who drank beer, the lower really? class. Really? Yeah. Wow. So it was already at that time, like, yeah, oh, look at that wine snob. Um, uh. Ancient Egypt consumed a lot of beer. Uh, and then they say that uh, in Europe, we, you already had like grain beers and mead in the first millennium BCE. Right. And uh the and then wine was introduced into Greece in the third millennium BCE. Huh. Wow. And and the advantage of uh wine over beer was that before hops were added to beer, uh beer would spoil really quickly. Re- so uh, 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 okay. Really? Yeah, so that wine you could put in a jug and seal the jug and you could ship it around the Mediterranean. Um but beer didn't last very long. Okay, wow. Why? Hmm. I don't understand. Uh, I guess just no preservative in the grains themselves. Mm-hmm. No preservatives, and they would just go bad. Okay. Um, oh. All right. And then uh, distilled alcohol, the Greeks were doing uh, dis- distillation in Alexandria back in the 4th century of the Common Era. So 4th century CE, C- uh, which was much later. That they started yeah. doing the um, distilled alcohol. And then Arab chemists were also distilling plants to use them in perfumes at that time. Mm-hmm. And uh, then that the 12th- must have led to heroin, too. That must have been when heroin <laughs> was like those yeah. poppies. Well, Imagine it's the it's, first guy who like tasted some of that uh, resin off the poppy and went, oh, whoa. man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> trying to walk home from work that day, you know, <laughs> it's like, something's off. Uh-oh. Uh, but, but they say it's kind of the same thing with drugs now. It's like they would distill, historically, they distilled alcohols to be used in medicine to kind right. of like treat, right. treat diseases. And then somebody was like, hey, what yeah. did you just do? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, all those doctors were doing it. They they would drink in their drinking their tinctures and getting wasted. Yeah. Sherlock yeah. Holmes, all of them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
then just real quick in uh in the new world you had of course like the incans had a maize based alcohol called chicha in the th- mm. third century ce mm. uh, the mayans drank a maize beer called balche maize and the beer Aztecs, corn beer yeah corn beer mm. so. Sounds good. <laughs> yeah, you're licking your lips. Yeah. For those mm, of you who can't see him, John is like mm. really. Uh, <laughs> and the Aztecs drank a fermented agave drink called pulque. And oh, I think you Jesus. can still get pulque. Yeah, yeah I, bet, I bet that w- fucks you up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, Dietler notes that from an anthropological standpoint, drinking is often seen as uh, a significant force in the con- in the construction of the social world, both in mm-hmm. the sense of creating an ideal imagined world of social relationships and in the pragmatic sense of strategically crafting one's place within that imagined world. We're yes. challenging it. Yeah. And a lot and of bonding really go- takes place over a beer. Yeah, exactly. And he goes into talking about how alcohol, like custom or cultures throughout the world use alcohol to kind of define relationships between people, kind of define someone's identity. And and he talks about how like regional, national, and cosmopolitan identities frequently involve drinking practices. Yeah. That may I mean, I I wonder if our friendship would be the way it is if we <laughs> hadn't have drank and partied so much. I mean, you know. What that, I, well to me know. That's what I mean. That's what's kind of interesting that our relationship survive. Yes. <laughs> survive that. Yeah. Like we're still friends. Yeah. Like I feel yeah. like we've, uh, we went through that period of like, yeah, we had that in common that we were like always out getting fucked up together. Yes. But but now when we both became sober, you would think, well, are we going to maintain a friendship out of that? Right. Because that's a hard time. Yes. When you first get sober. You know. Yeah. For sure. For sure. You feel very, you know, you're everything you leaned on is, is, is different now. Right. Right. And, and, uh, and you're I feel different. like the- I've lived two lives, you know, really. I yeah. was telling my daughter that, you know, I got to, to live two lives. Yeah. It's crazy. And it's, uh, it's hard when you're, when you decide to get sober and everybody else, you know, is still, <laughs> still partying <laughs> and getting fucked up because you, you have yeah. nothing in common with them anymore, or you you right. like right. You're there, and they're all drunk, and you suddenly realize, wow, these conversations aren't as interesting as what, what I, what I, I used know. To think that, that was they one were. of the first things I noticed was like, there's at every party, there's a period where people just start yelling the same stuff at each other. <laughs> you know, like the, it's so bizarre. Yeah. But you know what I'm talking about? Like a party, yeah, will, yeah. a party where people are drinking. There, you usually, you know, somewhere around midnight. Yeah, it'll just flip, and suddenly everybody's just screaming at each other. <laughs> <laughs> well, but I also always... you, you, meaning the sober person, also points out to other people who are questioning whether they should get sober. And you're kind yeah. of a bad remind. You're you're a buzz killer. You know, you're like, oh, yeah. Jesus, yeah. maybe I should be doing what he's doing, or or yeah. whatever. Mm-hmm. But I used to, I, I remember being pissed off at like the sober person at the party. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like, why are you even here? Why are yeah. you even here? What's wrong with you? Never... I don't really have any uh, problems with people who are sober, but people who had never tried alcohol or drugs, that yeah. always freaked me yeah. out. I was like, what's wrong with you? Yeah. I think it's, yeah. I mean, socially and culturally, I think you should at least try it, you know? Yes. And everybody will go down there. We are a pro-drug podcast is what we're saying. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just try it. it you try know, it. Don't let it get out of hand, but just yeah. try it. It's like, I would, you know, stick, your I would stay away from heroin and meth. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know. that, that one, but, those, I, although they feel amazing, I don't recommend them. Uh, the other thing that always pissed me off was also like uh, when somebody would have just like like Mary could have just like a little tiny, just part of a beer or not even uh, she yeah. doesn't drink beer, like part of a wine cooler. Right. And she'll be, and, put a cap and, on it and put it back in the fridge. Yeah. And I'm like, Ugh. yeah. I remember like, early on when I was dating Jennifer and I was, you know, fairly new, newly sober. I was a couple of years sober. Yeah. And we went out on a date and we were having sushi and she had some... Uh, 
some wine and uh or sake or something and uh i was like uh, we're gonna go to a movie and i'm like hey yeah finish your drink and we'll, we'll go and she's yeah. like oh no i'm i'm done i'm 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 not thirsty <laughs> and i remember thinking thirsty <laughs> thirsty yeah yeah what does that have to do with drinking <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I and there's still a part of me like I haven't drank in years and years. But when I see that, I just like, what are you doing? Why, what are you why doing? Why did you even open it if you're not going to like drink the whole thing? If you're not, I, I drink was the guy pack, at, at you know? a real. I was the guy at last call at bars when they said last call. I'd go around drinking everybody else's drinks, you know, like a cigarette butt in it, and <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just I'm, spit that I'm the out. Same way. It, it used to piss me off too, like when. uh like somebody, like a person you know who doesn't smoke would be like, "Hey, can I have a cigarette?" You know, you'd be oh, at the bar and stuff. Like, can I just have that. a cigarette? No, I'd be like, "Well, you don't smoke." Well, yeah, I just want to have one right now. And yeah. then you see them just taking those little baby puffs on that yeah. thing. <laughs> yeah, God damn it, I hated that. And now with the prices, because we both quit smoking too. Yeah, it's yeah. That's, that's the craziest thing is that we both quit smoking and drinking. That's crazy to me. Yeah, how the hell yeah. did that happen? And you, we did them at the same time, right? You, yeah, you did them all at the same time. Yeah, yeah. Yep. I quit smoking before I quit drinking, which is the craziest <laughs> thing ever. That's how <laughs> crazy I was. I uh, I did them all. I think I've mentioned before. I did them all like at the same time. Like quit that's, drinking, quit yeah. doing drugs, quit doing, got out of a bad relationship. And I wanted to tear my face off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just, it was awful. It's miserable. Yeah. Miserable. It's horrible. Horrible. Uh, so Dealer, <laughs> to get back, Dealer lists some of the other ways that our social and cultural identities may be constructed by alcohol. And one of the things he says is, is that spatial distinctions. So we, we tend to, we can segregate into separate drinking places for different groups. And, and I kind of think about like when going to a party in high school or going to any party and it's always like the cool people always end up in the kitchen. <laughs> yep. For example, you know what yep. I mean? It's like yep. the, the party kind of separates out of like, okay, these are the real partiers are going to be yes. in the kitchen. Yes. You know this, what I mean? Let's get down to business now. Yeah. <laughs> let's yeah. roll our sleeves up. Or, you know, like like the older adults, like, okay, we're going out to the garage to have our drink. You know, like yeah. the, the, everybody yeah. else is in having Thanksgiving dinner. We're all going out to the garage to, you know, smoke a bowl or whatever it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the other thing he talks about is temporal distinctions, meaning the order of serving or timing of drinking events. So, again, mm. I think this one kind of comes down to like, okay, we're all getting a, we're all going out to toast so-and-so. He's getting married or something. Right. You know, <clears throat> uh, and then the quantitative distinctions about like how much you drink. And again, that's kind of cultural because I know, like I knew a lot of Eastern Europeans in Chicago and not saying every Eastern Europe, but there was a lot like when you, drank, <laughs> you drank to like, yeah. you were passed out and you did not, you yeah. did not. That's the way up. I drank. I drank until I couldn't <laughs> yeah. pick a glass up. Yeah. Yeah. Or or, but or I, just vomiting or whatever, passed out. Yeah. Yeah. So I think there is, there's like a cultural, you can define a culture by like how it is. I used to always, it was exhausting because I wanted to be as drunk as possible without appearing that I was drunk. Mm, and, the, mm -hmm. and, and that was, oh God, the amount of effort at a certain yes. point to try to pretend yes. like you were drunk. And yes. Awful. Yeah. Um, and then, <laughs> so, I, you know, I, I always remember the, uh, the night before I quit drinking was the night before Thanksgiving. And I was so pissed off because everybody else had left Chicago and they'd all gone home to be with their families or whatever. Uh, all, even all of the bars were closing early and I was like, so wasted. So, and I still remember just going down the street, like yanking on doors, trying to, trying to find an open bar yep. to get into and uh yeah it was in just chicago awful. if you can't find a bar in chicago something's wrong yeah that's what yeah it made me want to move is yeah. really what, what, well that's what when you go to 7-eleven and buy some cough syrup yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> which i uh, did a few times oh really there oh, was a yeah. few hours when chicago bars weren't open 
Like one closed, I think the last one closed at four. There were like between 4 a.m. and 7 a.m. No liquor oh, yeah. ser- was served in Chicago. So yeah. I, we would wait for the 7 a.m. bar to open uh, and we'd go by 7 Eleven. I'd go by 7 Eleven, pick up a little uh, little cough syrup. <laughs> they don't raise the, the, that. The, <laughs> yeah, uh, in a pinch. You yeah. know, in a pinch. Yeah. Yeah, I remember like going to like going to a diner. You know, try to find an all night diner for those two hours or yeah, whatever before yeah. the bar opened back up. Oh, I worked at a twenty four hour diner, and that's what would happen at four a.m. All these drunk people oh. would just come in. It was the worst, the worst. <laughs> They'd either tip you nothing or fifty bucks. You know what I mean? They nobody. It was no rhyme or reason. It was just pure chaos. <laughs> uh. Another thing Dietler mentions, uh, which I think is important to our discussion, uh, is the use of alcohol in religion. So yes. a lot of religions will use alcohol. Yeah. And it was because, and, and not only like for communion or something, but also j- like as a way to commune with the divine, I guess. is Right. Is There's I mean. a Jewish holiday. I think it's Shemini Yatzeret, where it's yeah. one of them, where you're supposed to drink so much, this is for the Orthodox Jews, you're supposed to drink yeah. so much, you're supposed to drink until you don't know the difference between good and evil. <laughs> so in some some Orthodox uh, synagogues out here in LA, you'll see yeah. people just wasted out, out of their minds, just you know, really? jumping, s- singing and dancing and yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, and well, Dealer says it's it's because inebriation induces altered states of consciousness, and alcohol yeah. has frequently played a prominent role in rituals of both a religious and secular nature. And I think maybe that's why when we talk about I'm I don't know I'm grasping for straws here, but maybe it's because when we start talking about like slaying dragons and demons <laughs> and all this stuff, is that we know that it's it's a link to another consciousness in right. a way or yeah. you know a supernatural consciousness yeah i mean i had i i remember you know i took a lot of hallucin- hallucinogens and and it was yeah. never like one person pointed out to me and i really like this explanation you're not inside the house of god but you're outside looking in a window you know <laughs> like you you can yeah. see it yeah and and yeah. and uh, that's where it can be useful, you know. Yeah, interesting. <laughs> uh, so, moving on is is addiction a new phenomenon? And uh, in the book, the urge, our history of addiction, Carl Fisher says that the ancient Greeks had a word philopates, which meant a lover of drinking sessions. Mm. So we're kind of going back to the ancient Greeks here. I was a philopidus. And- <laughs> yeah. God damn. I philoped. Yeah. Damn, did I philope. <laughs> uh, and he says that the ancient Greeks also had a term called akrasia, A-K-R-A-S-I-A, which meant weakness of the will or doing something even though you truly believe it would be better not to. <laughs> <laughs> Or recognizing in the moment that you are acting against your better judgment. Oh. And I completely know this. I completely know this yes. feeling. I know I shouldn't be doing it, but I do it anyway. Acrosnia? Right. Acrosia? That'd be a good name for a band. Acrosia. Acrosia. Yeah. That's a good name for a band. Acrosia. <laughs> yeah. Knowing yeah. you shouldn't do it, but do- doing it because you shouldn't be doing it. I yeah. even relished in doing what I knew I shouldn't be doing. You know what I mean? Like I, <laughs> yeah. I was all yeah. in. <laughs> uh, yeah. That that moment of like, oh man, I should just go home. But, <laughs> no, I'm not, I'm not. I'm not going home. No, I'm not that's going not home. happening. Yeah. My daughter, uh, and she's coming up a lot on today's podcast. But she said to me um, that she said, "Dad, have you ever heard of something called dad lore?" And I'm like, no. And she's like, that's those are stories that dads have that just surprise <laughs> that that shock you. And she's like, you are the king of dad lore. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They have no idea. They no have idea. no idea what you've done. No. Yeah. No. No. Yeah. No. Thank God. They don't yeah. need to know everything. <laughs> I was like, I I've been around you and your kids. <laughs> I've seen how they kind of respond to you. And you're kind of this lovable dad. But I'm like, you I've <laughs> You don't know. 
you don't know. Uh, if, if Fisher says the first term of the word addict in English was actually in, in the 1500s. Hmm. And he says a guy named John Frith used the Latin term adicere, A-D-D-I-C-E-R-E, hmm. which meant speak to or say to or given over to. Hmm. And Fisher says that Frith was actually using that word adicere in reference to the Catholic Church and the Pope. <laughs> so, what? So, so he was talking about addiction as something you chose to follow that was against your better judgment. Oh, so of course like, he oh. was a, he was uh. a Protestant uh, writer at the time, uh-huh. and so he was saying the word addict was something that was paradoxical to your. It was like willed compulsion uh, that was outside your individual control. But Love I thought it. that was interesting that it was actually used in in a completely non substance related. The opiate of the uh, masses, you know? Yeah. R- yeah. Religion. Uh and and it kind of comes down to again this kind of will we've talked about the willpower of like, you know, oh well it's just they're they're not using their willpower. That's the reason right. why they're an addict. Right. Or that's the reason why they're making bad choices is they're not I, using I their- can't I can't tell you how many people said to me thinking they were actually giving me advice. Hmm. When they would say, you should just stop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I'm like, yeah. um, that's not so helpful. <laughs> I don't yeah. think you understand the problem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. I, it's, and again, it's like, if you don't have an addiction, if, if then it, that makes perfect sense. Like, oh, just stop. Just right. stop doing it. Right. But. But yeah, that's not the problem. No. <laughs> that's not the problem. <laughs> that means uh, you're not an addict. Yeah. So what were some of the other things? We've talked about alcohol. We've talked about uh, what were some of the other uh, substances that people or humans have become addicted to over the over history? Of course, there's opium. Opium. Um, God. Yeah. I had some opium once uh, <laughs> yeah. a few times. And yeah. uh, the first time you try it, you're like, oh, I see why China fell. You know? <laughs> it's just like, yeah. okay, I get it. Yeah. I get it. And we, we said this in our show, but, you know, the thing that people don't understand about, you know, uh, heroin is, is that they're like, but you're throwing your life away. And what they don't understand is it's worth it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. worth throwing your life away. That's how good it feels. <laughs> like, yeah. I know I'm throwing my life away, but it's worth it. Yeah. And yeah. that's, that's like the difference. <laughs> yeah. Remember it's, we had that joke in the show where we said that uh, it, heroin, people would still do it even if it wasn't addictive. That's how right. good it is. <laughs> I always thought was hilarious. Right. Uh, It it really cuts to the core because I think people tend to focus on getting hooked on it. But what they don't seem to take into account is how amazing uh, it feels. And and that's (laughs) the thing. Uh, They're not idiots, uh, uh, you know, junkies. They're just, um, you know, they can't come back. You just can't come back. You know, the last time I had a really good, (laughs) I went in to get a colonoscopy, actually. Mm. And that was like the last time. It it was like, it makes me look forward to having another colonoscopy. Yes. Because it was like. uh, What was it they gave you? The the Michael Jackson stuff. Um, Oh, God, I can't think of it. Anyway, yeah, that's, I mean, you you see why Michael Jackson threw it all away. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> it's, like, it's amazing. They put me out. They put me out. I had no, and then came to like late, you know, it was all over like a couple hours later or whatever. Yep. And it was just like, that was the best couple hours I've had since I quit drinking. And yeah. Drink. It's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. People say like, well, didn't you, you know, when you take heroin, you throw up. Wasn't that horrible? And it's like, no, not <laughs> <Yeah>. one bit. <laughs> it's like going to the bathroom. Yeah. Yeah. I did. Uh, then you had, of course, uh, related to opium, you had laudanum, which mm. was popular in the 1800s. Yeah. Teacher. And laudanum was, yeah, it was laudanum was opium mixed with water and alcohol. Yeah. Which Jesus. was good. And then would you drink it or would you inhale it or how, what would you do with it? I guess you'd you shoot would, it. You would drink it. It'd be like, in a, they would sell it everywhere. Like they sold laudanum over the counter. Like, like poppers. <laughs> like groceries. Yeah. <laughs> Remember how you yeah. could get poppers everywhere? 
at record stores. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it was the same way. You could go into it like a, uh, you could go in and just, you know, you, at the grocery store, they give it for a cough or menstrual cramps. Mm-hmm. Uh, they'd it, also it give it to all. They give it to babies, <laughs> which I always <laughs> love to. Like you would have ch- children's cordials that would, uh, it was basically laudanum, but that was just like, if your kid was a little cranky, mm-hmm. a little colicky, but really mm-hmm. it was just like if your kid was up and you wanted them to be quiet. Yeah, for a while, night, so night. You, could, <laughs> yeah, you would give them laudanum, basically. My opiate. mom gave me a hot toddy when I was a kid for a cough. Really? You know? Yeah. A little whiskey in there. Yeah, you, whiskey uh, and honey and hot water and lemon. <clears throat> and uh, yeah. yeah. I was in England one time and I had a toothache and the people I was staying with uh, who are English, uh, they, they, <laughs> they dipped a Q-tip in whiskey and told me just to bite down on that there Ooh. where my tooth, like to kind of like let the mm-hmm. whiskey numb my, my toothache. Yeah. It'll work. You know? Yeah. And I was just like, as a, as a drinker at the time, I was just like dipping that. It still hurts. Yeah. I was just <laughs> dipping that Q-tip in there all the time. <laughs> Um, I came across a, uh, a Scientific American article in June 1855 that was talking about the improper use of laudanum. So this is in 1855. Mm. And, and the author of that Scientific American was saying, the use of this preparation of opium is becoming fearfully prevalent among the female sex of our population. Mm. So, so women the Ladies were... love the laudanum. <laughs> yeah, they were just always... Uh, I guess it was a problem. 1855, they already realized that, hey, man, there are people, are, people are really drinking this stuff. Yeah. Well, it was miserable being alive. Yeah. Everybody died young and, oh. Um, probably the most famous laudanum addict was a guy named Thomas De Quincey, who wrote a book in 1821 called Confessions of an English Opium Eater. Yes. <laughs> yes. I'm familiar, it's- thanks to you. Yeah, and he uh, he hung out with like Samuel Taylor Coleridge and all the other romantic poets of the time, who were all doing laudanum. And uh, apparently, he he's one of the first guy. Uh, forget William Burroughs; they think that uh, De Quincey was like one of the first junkie authors. Like uh-huh. he wrote that book, kind of uh-huh. talking about being a junkie. And uh, the thing about him is, they always say, you know, he he's supposed to be writing about how bad it is, but he makes it seem so good it makes you want to do laudanum. right, right. That <laughs> well, I you know, I uh, there was a very <laughs> famous improv uh, guru in Chicago named Del Close, who was a a, a junkie, and uh, and yeah. I we were I was at his house, and he was quitting heroin, uh, and his mode of quitting heroin was to eat opium. So he had a hunk of opium <laughs> and was eating it like a candy bar. And that was yeah. my first experience with real opium because he broke yeah. off a piece and said, <clears throat> hey, here you go. <clears throat> you know, we talked improv a little while and then we went back and, and smoked that opium. And I was just yeah. like, holy moly. I found uh, it. I found the answer. Yeah. It was... Uh- yeah, it seems like there's always a way to like the the way to like cure alcoholism was morphine. <laughs> the way to the way to cure morphine addiction was cocaine. Yeah. The way to cure cocaine was opium. You know, it was like just a cycle <laughs> yep. of people treating things because quitting um, stuff sucks. It sucks, yeah. and you want something to ease the pain. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> you can't. The only way out is to embrace the pain. You have to you have to let the yeah. pain flow, and uh, yeah, yeah, that's, it hurts. That's, it, it hurts. Fucking, <laughs> fucking hurts. It hurts. But yeah, but uh, I don't know. I got into the pain as right. well after a certain point of like, ah, I'm just me too, me too, yelling through the whole thing. Yes, that was it. That was the thing for me. I, I when I was quitting smoking, everybody said, "How did you quit smoking?" And I said, "Whenever I wanted, I didn't throw any cigarettes away. I didn't flush them down. Yeah. I left the cigarettes right by my bed because I knew I could get them. It wasn't that yeah. you know. And every time I I jonesed for a cigarette." I would borrow a cigarette from somebody, light a lighter, and hold it as close to the tip <laughs> as I possibly yeah. could. Yeah, and yeah. I'd be shaking, and I it'd be, and it, but it, you know, yeah. any any avoidance is it's not going to take you home. 
You got to just go yeah. right into the teeth of the dragon. <laughs> um. So in in the uh, early 1800s, of course, we had the opium, and then uh, in 1898, there was a they came up with uh, heroin, which mm-hmm. was a derivative of morphine. So it actually mm-hmm. it actually went opium, and then they they created morphine from opium, and then heroin from from morphine. Yeah, and morphine is supposed to be 70 times more powerful than than uh opium yeah yeah i've had i've had some morphine yeah i remember once i was in the in the in the hospital and uh jennifer my wife had severe stomach pains and she has a low tolerance for pain so she's shrieking and they finally give her some dilaudid and they gave her like a half a hit of dilaudid and then set the syringe down. I was like a few years sober at this point. They sent the syringe yeah. down and then the nurse <laughs> left. <laughs> it was just me, Jennifer, and a, they and a half really real. real. Right <laughs> oh my God. I was just looking at it going, this is ridiculous. I, I, yeah. And Jennifer's yeah. like, it feels terrible. And I'm like, no, that's not terrible. That's good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're absolutely wrong. Uh, and they talk about, well, the syringe, you mentioned the syringe and that seems to be like, that was really kind of helped morphine take off back in the yeah. 1800s is when they yeah. created the hypodermic syringe. Yeah. And, uh, and apparently opiate use was, uh, really increased because of all the wars. Yeah. That were Civil going War. On in the 1800s. Yeah. 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 And they, they would call like the morphine addiction became known as the army disease after the civil war because so many people were uh addicted to it yeah um and then uh of course uh cocaine became popular in the late 1800s Hmm. and and again it's always so strange to me (laughs) like how people would sigmund freud said that it wasn't addictive right you know right you know right uh it, was and they always... That was one of the things he was wrong about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, there's so many things, but that that one always sticks out. To me. Well, why, you're doing it a lot, you know. Yeah. Oh, it's great. It's great. Yeah. yeah. No, no, it's very helpful. Uh, and then also, uh, ether became drinking ether. ether, ether. But not only inhaling it, but drinking ether Ooh. became very popular in Northern Ireland in the 1800s. Yeah. And the reason was is that there were high taxes on alcohol, so then people, <laughs> there were low taxes on ether, so then Jesus. people started drinking ether. Ether, my God! Yeah. And one of the big proponents of it uh, was a guy named Doctor. Uh, let's see, he was a, a guy named Doctor Kelly who he took a, a pledge to stop drinking, an anti-alcohol pledge, and his way of dealing with it was drinking ether. <laughs> so he felt like he wasn't he wasn't breaking the pledge yeah. if he drank ether. Well, that's how it, I quit smoking cigarettes. I just smoked weed, tons and tons <laughs> and tons of weed, <laughs> and it helped. I, yeah, I'm not smoking cigarettes. No, nope. kicked it. Easy kicked as that. It. Done. Uh, they said also what was great about ether for people that were drinking ether at the time uh, was <laughs> like you would be really screwed up out on the streets. And by the time the cops picked you up and got you back to the uh, back to the police station, you were completely sober. Right, right. It would move through you pretty fast. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of like doing nitrous oxide. You know, uh, yeah. it, it'll yeah. hit you, but it leaves pretty quickly. Yeah, <laughs> so I'm sure the cops were like, "What? He's completely sober." You yeah, know, like they go into like, you know, how many fingers am I holding it? up? Why four? <laughs> God damn it! <laughs> Like they're dragging you in, you know, yeah. like you, you can't even stand. Officer, officer, please. <laughs> <laughs> just so frustrating to them. It's like disappearing ink, you know what I mean? <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> uh, so then finally, John, just to get at uh, some of the miracle cures, which oh, I think were probably the worst. Than, yeah, yeah, these are great. Uh, in the book Slaying the Dragon, The History of Addiction, Treatment, and Recovery in America, William White, who, very nice guy, we've communicated with William yes, White we have. by email. Yes, we have. Uh, 
he he goes into detail about all the cures that came up. And it seems like people were always coming up with miracle cure. Everybody wanted like a yeah. silver bullet, something that of would course. just yeah. stop the addiction. Well, they're addicts. I mean, they've gotten, yeah. they wanted a silver bullet for dealing with life. And now they want a silver <laughs> bullet for getting rid of the thing that they thought was going to help them deal with life. Yeah. Yeah. Uh so one of the one of the most famous ones, famous ones, is Doctor Leslie Keeley's double chloride of gold remedy. Oh. And uh, they and shot said it was, gold into people. Yeah, well, at one time, I mean, they think that early forms of the formula actually had gold in it. Jesus, but but who knows what he was putting? Yeah, in it later. Like apparently, yeah. you had it, he would franchise his clinics. And if you if you signed on, if you got if you're a franchisee, uh, you had to sign a non disclosure agreement saying that you wouldn't reveal what was in <laughs> what was in the formula, which makes me think that God only knows what was in the formula. Yeah, yeah. And two drops of urine. <laughs> and, uh, what? Yes. And, and so, but at that time, to say gold, like gold, anything was like yes. the gold standard, right? The gold, it's expensive, gold would, therefore it must work. Yeah, it's right. brilliant. It's brilliant. And, and so, people would come down to the Keeley Institute, which was in Dwight, Illinois. And I always found it interesting that that when all of the, <laughs> these alcoholics came down there. Keeley didn't provide like a dormitory or anything for him. He right. didn't want him on his property, you know. Right. Like, so they had yeah. to stay with with local people in the town, and then Jesus. like four times a day, they would walk over to the Keeley Institute and get shot up with this double chloride of gold. Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus. And uh, you know, some of the other one that was kind of interesting to me was. Uh, you know, in the 1800s was kind of like when people were coming up with uh, antibodies and coming up with like different medicinal vaccinations for people. And one of them was, you know, usually they would use an animal's blood. So, for example, the dip- diphtheria antitoxin was developed from horse's blood. Right. So another one of the somebody was like, well, maybe if we give a horse alcohol, yeah, <laughs> we get a horse drunk, make the horse horse an alcoholic, yeah. Then <laughs> out from his blood, we'll make a concoction that we'll then put into people's bloodstreams. Right. Right. Jesus and it, Christ. And, and it kind of made sense to people, yeah, you know, with kind of like limited uh, scientific not? medicinal, yeah. like oh, okay. I'm just literally like, how how much alcohol do you have to give the horse, dude? Yeah, a lot. <laughs> if you've ever been to Tijuana, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, there was all, you know, you could buy these these uh, anti-alcoholism uh, tinctures, or you could buy all mm. these medis- medicines for to stop alcoholism, even through Sears Roebuck catalog. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There, um, there was also something called the White Star Secret Liquor Cure. That came in a box of 30 capsules. And uh, again, what, you know, William White says that the main ingredient in the White Star secret liquor cure was cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> I feel great. I quit It'll drinking. Take the edge off. Great. Yeah. And, uh, you know, one of the most frightening cures, I, I think, that I read about then were the cures that were. They were marketed to the spouses of the alcoholic. Uh huh. Yeah. And and the thing is, these were cures that you would you would drop into <laughs> into the alcoholic's coffee without or him knowing his food. it. Yeah. Right. It and that just seems terrifying. To yeah. Me because the hallucinations or like just just how awful you feel when you're yeah. getting sober. Yes. And not know that you're getting sober. Right. It, is just terrifying to me. Yes. Like I understand the purpose of it of like, well, you you'll just make your husband better, you know, yeah. or your wife better, but it's like well, the how dishonesty cruel and horrible, and the, horrible yeah. it is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, John. So wow. we could go on talking about addictions for hours. Yes, we could. Uh, but I will say, if if people want to hear more, they'll they'll have to come see Addiction One Hundred One. Yes, when you go into more detail, or check out our reference list, which because you know all of these, Mister McRae, Professor McRae reads all these books. 
And yeah. we have a very detailed reference list <clears throat> that's for um, if you go to our Podbean uh, uh, page or if you go to our YouTube, you'll see them. We post them all in there. This is a yeah. very well researched. It's amazing what you do. Really is. It's it's that compulsive energy that I used to use for partying is now used, used for, for just like a, a podcast. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Good. Uh, so, John, I, I just I guess I will say, and, and you've mentioned it before too. Like, I I don't regret anything I did before. I don't yeah, think. Right. Like, right. like I was, you know, I'm glad I was a drunk. I'm glad I'm not a drunk anymore. You know, it's just, and you've mentioned it where you say, like, you meet people who are like, I wish I had done something else, or I wish I had done such and such. And and I don't. I feel like I did it all myself. Me too. So. It's like I, uh, you run into people who say, God, I wish I had, you know, sowed my oats more uh, in my 20s or yeah. something. And I'm, I'm looking at them going like, not me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will say I had a lot of fun, and and I'm glad I'm not having that type of fun anymore. Yeah, I guess, and it, I'm it glad does. we're alive because so many people we know weren't and uh, yeah. didn't, and uh, yeah, boy, I don't know why we we are the ones that are still alive, but I'm glad we are. Yeah, and and I will say like for anybody who's struggling with addiction or has an addiction or is, is recently recovered. Uh, yeah, it sucks, and, but you're not alone. I guess. Yeah. I guess I would say is yeah. like there are people there who are going through the same thing, who have gone through the same thing. So yep. just hang in. We're there. all in this together. Yep. Yeah. Just keep doing it. Just do yeah. the next thing in front of you. And and honestly, life is weird being so. <laughs> yeah. Like, it's really weird. Like, really. Yeah. It's it's much more fucked up being so, like oh seeing life. Oh my god. Sober Stone is, cold like, sober. What about yeah. sex, Stone Cold Sober? Oh. The first time I had sex, I was just like, what? What do I do? Yeah, what do oh. we do when it's over? <laughs> do we talk? <laughs> like, what? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Glass half full. You can still find weirdness in life. I oh, guess, yeah. Oh, yeah. You never know. You All might right, find John. yourself doing an anthropology uh, podcast <laughs> with your bestie. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You never know. See what happens. See what happens when you quit. <laughs> All right. Well, this is human number two. Signing and off. Is, Sorry. And, and this is human number one. Thank you so much for joining us, everyone. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. If you did, please tell a friend about it because, mm. uh, you know what? I would love to open an intro to anthro uh, clinic. <laughs> kind of like the Keeley thing. Like yes. an institute. Intro yes. to anthro institute. We're <laughs> listeners and fans of the show. You can come and stay for four weeks and just come to lectures and kind of hang out. You know, we won't shoot you up with gold or anything, but I mean, you can kind of hang out and everybody kind of, we play games. and we. I love the, that um, idea. Fun. We need a little intro to anthro uh, retreat. Yeah. That's a good yeah, idea. We, we I like that. So we need... We need to get sponsors there, I guess I'm thinking like the full bit, like the Keeley Institute. I'm talking about like a full, like a full building where people can come. Yeah, and we'll let you say we'll have dormitory or like casitas or something where people. Yes. Can yeah. Yeah. That's a, that sounds <laughs> lovely. Yeah. <laughs> All right, everyone. Thanks for listening. We love you, John. Love you. All right. Talk to you and soon. I'll, all right. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye.